preaching of God's Word, and we do desire to see Christ. Um, there's a preacher down in Atlanta, Georgia, who says that we need to unhinge from the Old Testament that the uh, Old Testament really isn't relevant for us as believers today, and so why should we spend any time with it? We really need to focus in on the New Testament and see Christ in the New Testament. I hope today that as we work into Habakkuk, that you will see Christ. And that is my earnest prayer. I'm starting a new series today in Habakkuk called Just When You Thought You Had God Figured Out. And there's going to be four sermons uh, in this series and, and it's really easy to remember, all right? I'm going to give you all four sermons right now. The first one is why. The second one is what. The third one is whoa, like W-O-E. And then the fourth one is whoa, like W-H-O-A. So what or why, what, whoa, whoa. Say it with me. Why, what, whoa, whoa. Now you know the overview of Habakkuk, all right? So you know that. And as we continue to flesh this out over the next few weeks, I think you'll see uh, where I'm coming from. Let's pray together. Lord, it is our prayer, it's our earnest desire today that you would show us Christ. And we thank you for these songs that remind us of the deep and rich truths in your scriptures. Like Amy said, uh, that... uh, that these good songs that we sing often either are direct quotes from Scripture or they reflect the profound truths of Scripture. And it is a wonderful thing when the body of Christ comes together and opens our voices in praise to a God who so richly deserves our praise. So we thank you for that privilege that you've given us. And now, Lord, as we open up your text of Scripture, I just pray, Father, that you would fill me with your Spirit that I would utter things that are pleasing to you, that your spirit would be moving in hearts right now. Uh, This is not an entertainment event. This is not a time that we come together to have our ears tickled. But this is a time that we hear the very word of God. And so God, help me to be faithful in communicating your truth. And Lord, I pray that your spirit would definitely fill in the gaps where I drop the ball. And that we would all leave here changed, uh, more like Jesus Christ as a result of our time in your text, and it's in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Why doesn't God hear my cry? You know, I think that over the course of your life and over the course of my life, we can think of times in our lives where we have earnestly cried out to God, passionately cried out to God, where we're desperate before our God, For this thing or that thing. I'm sure that each one of us could give testimony of those times in our lives where we've cried out to God. You know, I remember crying out to God for, you know, oh, I hope Angie likes me. That was really important back then to me. Well, I I hope she's as head over heels in love with me as I am with her. It seems seems maybe trite now in comparison. No, No disrespect to our relationship but it seems maybe trite as we continued to march through our lives together. And then when our first child was born, and she was born with a blood uh, infection and a brain hemorrhage, and the doctors told us that she very likely was going to die. And I remember crying out to God, how can you do this? I just trusted Christ. I just, uh, two months prior to that, trusted Christ as my Savior. And, and I, I remember this panic as I looked over uh, this little, precious little girl with tubes coming out of every inch of her body. And, and she's grunting as she's breathing. And the reality is, is that she's, she very well could lose her life. That's what we were told. And I cried out to God can you do this? This And just a month prior, some of our very dear friends lost their baby. So it was just crushing in on me. Wow, how can this happen? I remember when my sister was getting divorced from my brother-in-law after 12 years of marriage. I remember crying out to God, what? I ran to my dad, and I'm like, Dad, do something. Can't you do something? I'm sure every one of us in this room have had those times over the course of your lives where you have cried out to God 
and there's no seeming immediate answer. It's frustrating. You're asking him for something that you know is his will, and, and, you, and yet he's not responding in the way that you think he should be responding, and it's frustrating, and it's irritating, and it's, and it's devastating. So that's what we're dealing with here with Habakkuk. Why all the suffering? Why? Why all the pain? Why doesn't God simply step in and put an end to it all? Why, why does he let this, this, this big blue ball keep spinning? When we look at those pictures from outer space, they're gorgeous, aren't they? You get to look at the pictures back at this big blue ball that, that, that uh, is floating in space, and it's just miraculous to think about. But the closer we zoom in on that big blue ball, we see more clearly the imperfections, and quite honestly and quite frankly, the downright nastiness, especially in regard to humankind. There's all kinds of suffering that goes on throughout our world, hunger and severe poverty. We seem helpless in order to try to fix that. We see commercials on television that pull at our heartstrings with little ones who are across the globe and they're drinking out of mud pits when we're able to go to the tap and drink clean, fresh water at any given moment of any given day without even thinking about it. Crime, wars, murder. I mentioned to you a few months ago that man who killed his wife and two precious little girls and buried them in a silo. What? Why? Why do these things happen? Political and governmental corruption. We're offered all kinds of promises. We just endured a political season and we're offered all kinds of promises. And I'm afraid that we will end up with status quo. I hope not. I know Brother Elliot's going to do his best to bring change in. But it's easy to get discouraged and downcast when we see political and governmental corruption. By the way, folks, this stuff's been going on for a very long time. Today we journey back to the 7th century B.C. and we're reminded that there is nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. The suffering that we face today, the, the trials that we face today, the questions that we face today were being asked way back then. Habakkuk was a prophet who was tired of all the injustice that was taking place around him, and he was very concerned about God and his reputation. And I want you to know that about Habakkuk. He was very, very concerned about God and God's reputation. He was very concerned about God's holiness and God's righteousness. He was very concerned, and he brought those concerns to the proper place, God himself. You see, Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, it was the southern kingdom of the nation of Israel, and this is where Habakkuk was dealing with this, with this situation. The only hint of the date of this book is its prediction of the Babylonian invasion of Judah in chapter 1, verse 6. But we don't know how far in the future that Habakkuk was predicting the events that would be coming. At this particular time when, when Habakkuk was written... There was no imminent threat of the Babylonians, but they were coming. And this is, this is what Habakkuk was writing about. He was very aware of their potential threat. And so uh, this Habakkuk's time was probably just around the end of Josiah's reign. Uh, before Josiah, Judah had radically turned away from God under the leadership of extremely wicked kings of Manasseh and Ammon. And the nation was ripe for punishment. Judah was morally, and I want you to hear this, Judah was morally and spiritually corrupt. They worshipped Baal on high places. They offered children to Molech. They dedicated horses to the sun god. They allowed the temple to fall into ruin. These are the kinds of things that were happening during, uh, during this period of time. And even though under Josiah's reign, 
where Josiah did that which was right in the eyes of God. There was a a brief revival, as it were, in in Josiah's reign. When When his predecessor came in, they fell right back into, right headlong back into sin. One thing Josiah did is he restored uh, the feast of the Passover. But as I said, quickly after Josiah died, they, they began to fall back into their evil ways. Listen, the fact of the matter is, is that Habakkuk was a godly man. He was a godly prophet. He was probably a leader of worship. Uh, we don't know much about Habakkuk. We really don't. The only thing that we know in the scriptures is that he is called a prophet. There's no, there's no information about him. There's some, uh, some information out there that is based on conjecture. But by and large, hear me when I say, we don't know much about Habakkuk other than what we experience of him in this text. And he lived in the period before the rise of the Chaldeans. And during the Judean king, Jehoiakim. So these are important things that we need to understand. And I would encourage you to get your Bible out because, you know, one thing that we do, and I've only got a a short period of time with you, and and I just want you to read through uh, not only this letter to Habakkuk, but I would encourage you to go to um, 2 Kings, and you can read read from like chapter 20, start reading, not right now, do it at home, okay? But you can start reading through, and you can read about the, uh, the reign of Hezekiah, you can re- read about the reign of Manasseh, his evil son, you can, you can read about all of those things, and then how Josiah came to the throne, and, and uh, how he had, they had this respite and this uh, revitalization for a period of time. I would encourage you to read that, because it's going to help you understand this letter even more. But the bottom line that I want you to understand here this morning is this, that Habakkuk had enough. This prophet, this prophet of God, had had enough. He was truly a righteous man who felt hopeless and helpless. He turned to God and he begged God to stop, to stop this nonsense that's going on. Yes, there was a season of revival. Yes, there was a season of restoration. But that season was going away. And one would think that God, of anyone, would want to deal with injustice quickly. Wouldn't you think that? You would think that God wants to deal with injustice quickly and severely. Yet oftentimes, many times, that is not the case. And that's the main thing that I want you to grapple with with me this morning. Because oftentimes we are tempted, we are tempted to think that God is in fact unjust. Because he's not dealing with justice the way he, we think he ought to deal with justice. When that man killed his wife and two children, I'm praying imprecatory prayers against him that God would strike him right now and be done with it. And it didn't happen. So is God for what this man did? See, we can go to that conclusion rather quickly if we're not careful. So when we're tempted to think God is unjust, simply look to the cross And I hope that you'll understand what this means a little more clearly by the time we're done today. But when you're tempted to think God is unjust, like Habakkuk was, he thought that, simply look to the cross. The first point I want to share with you this morning is how easy it is to complain about what we see. How easy it is to complain about what we see. As we look around at the world around us, to a nation that we once considered a uh, Christian nation, and now it's almost unrecognizable from when I was a kid at least. And it's really easy to complain. In fact, I've been around some of you that complain about this stuff. I'm guilty of it too. We complain, right? We complain about politics. Well, man, I'll tell you what, if I were in charge, then I would, man, I should be in, well, I would take care. And we complain and we complain and we complain. We have television, uh, we have television stations that give their entire existence to complaining about the other party. 
on either side of the aisle. They make a lot of money about complaining. That's what we do. We complain. We complain and we complain. And don't get me wrong, there are some things that are worth complaining about. But the fact of the matter is, is we complain. We complain about abortions. 50 million babies have been murdered. Murdered. It's awful. It's worthy of complaining about, right? Millennials complain about boomers, and boomers complain about millennials. We don't get each other. Complaining and complaining and complaining. And I, for one, can find it really easy to complain when things are not going my way in particular. And to be honest, as I listen, I hear a lot of Christians, and I see a lot of Christians on social media complaining and complaining and complaining. But not that, not that it's necessarily right to complain. We are in good company. Habakkuk has a complaint, uh, not, only, not, not just against anyone, but God himself. Habakkuk has a complaint against God himself. Look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice goes forth. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, and so justice goes forth perverted. Well, this begs a couple questions for us this morning. The first one is, why doesn't God hear my cry? Why doesn't God hear my cry? Prophets in the Old Testament had a pretty clear role, folks. If you were were a prophet in the Old Testament, you had a clear job description. They were to speak to God's people on God's behalf to encourage them to follow God and to warn them if they did not follow God. That was their job. If they didn't follow God they would proclaim there would be consequences. And as you read through the prophetic writings, you will hear this phrase often. Thus saith the Lord. Over and over again you see that. Thus saith the Lord. They are speaking on behalf of God. This was the job of a prophet. And in most cases, it was not a popular job because it usually found there they were usually inserted in when the children of of Israel were headlong into something they shouldn't be involved in and the prophet had to call him out on it and this wasn't always well received you can see this over and over again we got to watch little Elliot last night and uh, he's my little grandson and he's as sweet as can be most of the time He's also capricious, and he gets into things. And we have to say, Elliot, thus saith the Papa. And he looks at you, and he he has this, so he was in the bathroom, and I'm looking from my chair, and he was starting to open up a drawer, and I said, Elliot, because I knew he was going to get into my stuff. And he starts pulling his hand away a little bit, but he keeps staring at me. And he's just kind of testing me out to see if, and he's kind of still just kind of caressing the drawer that, uh, that I'm asking him not to get involved in, right? Elliot, you don't want to go there. Folks, that's what the prophet said. Children of Israel, you don't want to go there. The Lord has promised if you go there, there's going to be consequences and severe consequences this prophetic writing is altogether different this writing here in Habakkuk is altogether different in this writing the prophet at least in the first part isn't calling God's people to task for wrongdoings but the prophet is actually is actually calling God out for not doing what he is supposed to be doing imagine that this prophet is calling God on the carpet in verse 1 the author says 
And he starts out by saying, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Well, what does oracle mean? What does that word oracle mean? Well, the, in the Hebrew, the word oracle means burden. It means burden. To lift up, the verb, to lift up a burden. Habakkuk was burdened. He has a burden that he needs to unload. And this author that we know very little about tells us that he has a burden. What is this burden? In verse 2, it tells us, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? That's quite an indictment, folks. Lord, how long shall I cry out for help and you will not hear. Now, I think it's very interesting that the word Lord here is Yahweh. That's that covenant name of God. And he is reminding God that God, you are a covenant-keeping God. You want to tuck that away for a minute. He says, oh, Yahweh, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? God's man is calling God out himself. He says, I've, I've been crying out and crying out and there's no response. How long must I cry out? How long must I beg? And he doesn't stop there. In the end of verse 2, the prophet says, or cry to you violence and you want, will not save. Violence. Well, what is, what is, why is he saying violence? Well, certainly the world around Judah had degenerated to say the least. But this was not Habakkuk's lament. His burden was this, not just the world around him. That wasn't, that wasn't his main concern. But that his people had followed suit. His people had, had degenerated right along with the world around them. They had taken on the characteristics of the degenerated world. And the reality was there was little remorse about the degeneration. Yes, there was that brief season where young King Josiah became convicted as he read God's word and he made those sweeping national changes of repentance. But once he died and with the new wicked king in place, Judah's true heart became apparent once again and they adopted the violent, wicked ways of the world. That word violent, Hamas, in the Hebrew sounds remarkably similar to a word you might be familiar with in today's world, Hamas. Violence. Is it violent from God's perspective to disobey God? Yes. It does violence against God. Is it violent from God's perspective to worship other gods? Yes. Is it violent from God's perspective to allow the temple to fall into ruin? Yes. Is it violent from God's perspective to offer up baby infants to Moloch? As far as I remember in my study of this brutal practice, there was an a statue of Moloch that had his arms held out and there was a roaring fire going on inside of this statue of Moloch and parents would, or priests or whomever, would offer their child into the arms of Moloch and the babies would roll into the inferno. I mean, I, I get sick just thinking about it. And God's children were engaged in this practice. Is that violence against God? Yes. It's unbelievable violence against God. It's unconscionable violence against the character of and the grandeur of their one and only true God. Was he upset about the sin and the degradation and all that was going on around the world? Yes. But he was devastated. Habakkuk was devastated that they were engaged. The people of God were engaged in this kind of behavior. And here's Habakkuk. 
this true and righteous prophet of God. He is scratching his head and he's saying, God, why don't you do something? Why don't you punish your people? What are you waiting for? This is why Habakkuk called God Yahweh, to remind him of the, that he is the covenant God. He made a covenant with his people in Deuteronomy. One commentary said this, The covenant at Mount Sinai was between two parties, God and Israel, and neither can ignore his obligations. Habakkuk reminds God of the promised curses should Israel renege on her duties. You can check that out for yourself in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 15 through 68. I will tell you, a Reader's Digest version is, it's awful. The curses that God promises are awful. Do you understand what's going on in this passage? Habakkuk wants God to punish his people because his people have strayed far from him. And more than anything, this affects God's amazing glory. Habakkuk was demanding that God do something about this and do something now. What do you think about the purity of God's people at that point in time in history? It's appalling. What do you think about the purity of God's church today? God's called out people. Ecclesia. I have a question for you. Are you like Habakkuk? Or are you like Judah? It's a question worth ruminating through your mind. So, why doesn't God hear my cry? And then secondly, why doesn't God do my will? Why doesn't God do my will? Look at verses 3 and 4. Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surrounds the righteous. So justice goes forth perverted. Here again Habakkuk calls God on the carpet. I am a prophet and a servant of God. I love you God and I love your law. It's one, for me, it's one thing for me to look at the sin of the world. I get that. But why are you having me see the sin within your supposed holy people? Why are you doing nothing about it? That's what, that's what Habakkuk is accusing God of. Why do you idly look at wrong? In the Hebrew, this word idle means you are gazing at this wrong and not moving. You're just sitting there. Things are not getting better. And then he says, destruction and violence are before me. Strife and, a cont- and contention arise. Apparently, what he is saying is, your law is impotent. It has no power. It is not able to constrain the way that it should. MacArthur in his, in his, uh, in his note says this, the law is chilled. It's numbed. It has no respect It was not given any authority. As hands rendered useless by cold, the impact and effectiveness of the law was paralyzed by the corruption of Judah's leaders. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11, it says this, Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed speedily, the heart of the children of men is fully set to do evil. Do Do you hear what the author is saying here? If if I get away with something and nothing happens to me, then I'm going to continue doing it all the more. That's what he's saying. And that seems to be what is happening. Hey, I sinned against God today. Nothing happened. Must be okay. I'm going to do it again. Hey, I sinned against God today. Nothing happened to me. I'm going to do it again. And we base our righteousness on a situation rather than on God's holy will and God's holy word. That's what they were doing. And that's a warning for us today. Where do we place our desires? On doing the will of God or doing my will? 
For the wicked, the text says, the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Yes, there were a remnant of the righteous. There always are a remnant of righteous. And Habakkuk was one of them. But they were mocked. They were marginalized because of their stance for righteousness. Righteousness has never been well received, and the righteous have often paid the price Do you remember in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 38? It says, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. This is the job description of the righteous folks. Those people that are standing for righteousness, uh, the writer of Hebrews says this, this is what they got in this life for standing for righteousness. But yet, what does he say in verse 38? Of whom the world was not worthy. Isn't that beautiful? Those people who are willing to stand for God, to stand for righteousness, to stand for truth, the world was not worthy of them. Wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. Those people truly understood, those people truly comprehended that this is not their home. They are just passing through. That their prize is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. They had the right perspective. They had an eternal perspective. They stood for righteousness here, knowing that one day they would experience eternal righteousness there. But then there was one who was ultimately righteous, who did pay the ultimate price. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says this, My dear children, John writes, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous, the only righteous one. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of, the, uh, of all the world. So we have this beautiful promise from Jesus Christ that he is our advocate. He is the only righteous one. So we ask the question, why doesn't God do my will? Well, because maybe my will isn't right. Maybe my will is off. But is God's will off? No. So how easy is it for us to complain about what we see? Very easy. Because we see it. We see injustice just like Habakkuk saw injustice. And it's very easy for us to complain about these types of things. And in some cases, it's right for us to complain. Not just to complain, it should drive us to do something, if nothing less than pray. So what are you complaining about these days? Politics, sports, weather? I don't know. Habakkuk was definitely complaining. And, this, and his complaint was not trivial. It was substantial. God's holy name was being run through the mud by the outlandish, the the wicked living of God's people. Habakkuk was praying his head off that God would give a severe rebuke to them so that they would repent and that they would turn their hearts back to God. The prophet was frustrated. He was so frustrated that God seemed to be sitting on his hands and doing nothing. And from his perspective, from what he could see, That's worth complaining about. I have some questions for you this morning. Are you pleased with the state of the holiness of God's people today? I don't ask you that to cause you to look down your nose at God's people. I I ask you that for an honest evaluation. Are you pleased with the state of the holiness of God's people today? Number two... Are you pleased with the state of your own personal holiness? I think that's probably even a more appropriate question than a broader one as we look at the church around us because the church is comprised of individuals. It's comprised of you if you are in Christ. And this is a question that you ought to ask of yourself. Are you pleased 
with the state of your personal holiness? Are you, number three, passionately praying that God would do something? Do something to his church, to his people, to bring revival to God's people. Do you care? Or has apathy washed over your soul and caused a hardness that won't seem to dissipate? I think these are questions that come to mind when we see the passion of Habakkuk. When we see the concern of Habakkuk. When we see as he's looking at the children of Israel, their blatant disregard for the holiness of God, living whatever way they want to live, I'm admiring his passion. And we ought to have the same type of passion. So are you passionately praying that God would do something in his church? Are you passionately praying that God would do something in your soul? Pray that apathy hasn't had its way with you. By the way, you can tell if apathy is having its way with you by the sin that you allow in your life. It's a gut check for us. It's a time for each one of us in this room today to do a thorough job of repenting. The church of Jesus Christ needs to be a holy bride of Christ. And it needs to start with Allendale Baptist Church. We need to do a thorough job of repenting. We need to be very careful to do that. And if apathy is crushing into your life, you can tell that it is by the sins that you allow into your life. And then secondly, those little sins, those little sins, the Bible talks about those little foxes, will add up and drive a wedge between you and God. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not up here casting judgment upon you at all. I am a sinner saved by grace. And I have to do a thorough job of repenting day in and day out. I have to take an inventory of my spiritual walk with God day in and day out. And I will tell you that if I am not engaging my mind in His holy word, if I am not spending time on my knees praying for myself and for you and for my family and all the things that I pray about, if I'm not doing those things, I tell you what happens to me. There's a spiritual apathy that begins to wash over my soul, and then I begin to allow those little foxes, those little things to start infiltrating my life and causing a coldness and a hardness and an apathy to wash over me. It's not rocket science, guys, but it is serious business. And we see this in this letter from Habakkuk. The Bible tells us that we are to be content in all things. However, there is one area that we are to be passionately discontent with, our level of holiness. You and I are to be passionately discontent with where we are in our relationship with Christ. We need to continue to press on toward the mark, not looking behind us, but pressing on forward. If you want to complain about something, complain about that to God. God, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to grow in my holiness. Lord, I'm tired of where I'm at spiritually. I want to grow in my godliness. Lord, I need you by your spirit to transform me to become more like Jesus. That I'd be more like Jesus today than I was last year. And that next year I'll be way more like Jesus than I am today. That we can be discontent about. That we can pray about. And ladies and gentlemen, we need to be praying about that. We need to be making those decisions that God would change us in such a dramatic way. Second point that I want to share with you is this. How hard is it to trust what we don't see? How hard is it, well, how hard is it to trust what we don't see? We see injustice, we see pain, we see depravity, and we don't know what to do. We pray and we hope that something will happen. And we, like Habakkuk, pray that God will step in and, and make his people holy once again. But sometimes our prayers, as we've said, don't seem to go any higher than the ceiling. In fact, sometimes they feel like they bounce off the ceiling right back onto our heads. The heavens are like steel. And our hope quickly fades away. We, like Habakkuk, start to doubt God. 
We forget about who he truly is. We forget that he is just, that he is holy, that he is righteous, that, that he is very much concerned for his own reputation, that he does hear our prayer. Do you know that God hears your prayer? We forget that he is the author of history and that he is working all things according to the counsel of his will. We forget that he has a redemptive plan that he will see to completion regardless, regardless of how well we participate. And we forget that God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, why ever he wants. This is what he is about to remind the prophet. Take a look in the next few verses here. He says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their Horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff. At rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. They pile up earth and take it. They sweep by like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own might is their God. Now there are a couple things that that we can learn from these verses. First is this, trust that he hears your cry. You have to remember this, folks. Even though it may not seem like it, you must trust that he hears your cry. Habakkuk was crying out to God and, 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 if you remember, accusing God of not listening. Was God listening? Absolutely he was listening. Let me remind you of two things. First, God always hears your prayer if you are his child. He always hears your prayer. Now, he's not obligated to say yes to every one of your requests any more than you say yes to one of your child's requests unless you're a grandparent. Then all bets are off. I think I've shared with you my pastor's son who was quite a capricious young man when he was a little guy. He kept going to his, his dad, my pastor, and he said, Dad, I want a flamethrower. He's 10 years old and he wants a flamethrower. What do you think his dad says? No, I'm not giving you a flamethrower. What are you, crazy? It would not be good. It would not be prudent. Dad, I want a flamethrower. God's not obligated to say yes to our requests, but that doesn't mean he doesn't hear them. Secondly, God is more passionate about his holiness than you could ever think of being. It was a bit presumptuous and a bit arrogant for Habakkuk to impugn the character of God the way he did. By the way, what a glorious demonstration of God's grace and mercy that he allowed, think about this, he allowed this prophet to speak his mind to him and didn't crush him on the spot for those bold accusations. Think about that. Think about standing before the God of the universe and bringing those accusations. You do not hear, you do not save, you are not being the God that you're supposed to be. Wow. Imagine your son or your daughter coming to you and saying, you're not a good dad, you're a terrible dad, you're not doing what you're supposed to be. What? be careful about that. We want to understand that it was a glorious demonstration of God's mercy and grace for not crushing Habakkuk on the spot. But back to the point, God can take care of himself. God can take care of his holiness. We don't need to protect God any more than a lion needs our help. Spurgeon said that. We unleash the lion and let him do his work. Habakkuk's passion for God's holiness was laudable, but I believe he crossed the line when he called God's character into question. God God wasn't waiting around for Habakkuk to wake him up to the devastatingly sinful lifestyle of his children. The point, in fact, was that he had a plan all along, and he was orchestrating the perfect time to unfold this glorious plan. And the time was now coming very soon. And God is giving Habakkuk a sneak peek. We could call it a prophetic perk. 
He got to see what was coming down the, down the line. I picture God putting his arm around Habakkuk like a boss with a trusted employee and then says, <laughs> you are not going to believe what I'm about to do. You are, it's going to blow your mind. You're not going to believe it. And, and, and we'll see this next week in next week's sermon. Habakkuk is dumbfounded and even angry at God's solution. The point is this. Even though God had acted uh, and, and sin and violence, uh, or God hadn't acted at this point, and sin and violence were rampant in the lives and the hearts of his people, that didn't mean he was ignoring No, he was preparing to unleash something that would humble his proud children very effectively. God's not out out of control, folks. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know what you're facing. but, But God isn't in heaven going, man, I turned around for one minute and look at what happened. No. He knows exactly what's going on and he's using it for his glory and your good. You have to believe that. Trust me, my friends, if you're his child, he hears you. He absolutely hears you. But secondly, trust not only that he hears you, but that he will do not your will, but he will do his will. Every time he will do his will. That's what verses 6 through 11 say. He says, listen, I'm bringing up the Chaldeans. I'm bringing up the Babylonians. These are nasty people, but they are just pawns in my hand to do my bidding. It's going to blow your mind. The Babylonians were a nasty and a ruthless people. Uh, the, the Hebrew language, when you, when you read through the Hebrew language, it's very, uh, very picturesque. And, and, and it uses word pictures to help you understand more clearly uh, what is going on in the text. And he lists off several things. He says they're going to march through the breadth of the earth to seize a dwelling not their own. You can just picture an army marching over the expanse of the earth. It's huge. Their horses are swifter than leopards. I mean, can you picture a leopard and how fast, one of the fastest animals on land? And they're saying their horses, the Babylonian horses, are even faster than a leopard. What does that indicate? They're, they are swift in exacting and getting what they want. It says they're more fierce than evening wolves. When do evening wolves eat? When are they hungry? At night, in the evening, and they're fierce because of it. Their horsemen press on proudly. They are proud people. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. What do you picture in your mind when you see an eagle? Swooping over and attacking quickly. They all come for violence. All their faces are forward. That pictures that they are determined. They are all on the same page. They are all united in accomplishing this task of destroying what is ever in their wake. They gather captives like sand. Isn't that a beautiful picture? It's just they're, they're going through faces forward and they're just collecting up innumerable amount of captives. They are they're destroying everything in their wake. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. What is that that picture for us? They are not intimidated by anything or anyone. There is no one on the face of the earth that intimidates them. They They are ultimately, in their mind, ultimately powerful. No one can stop them. By the way, who's the king of Babylon? Nebuchadnezzar. Right? And what does Nebuchadnezzar say when he goes out that one day he stands out and he says, look at how amazing I am. And God had something to say about that, didn't he? He lost his mind for seven years. What does that remind us of? Are these guys ultimately powerful? No. No, there's one who is ultimately powerful, and that is the God of the universe. They sweep by like wind and go on. Uh, my friend Adam shared this with me. Adam and Sharon shared this with me. Or Shannon shared this with me the other night. A haboob is a dust storm. They told me about this. And this happens in uh, Arizona, right? 
So can you see that picture? That this, is, this is a dust storm that happens quite frequently in Arizona, and you can't see your hand before your face, from what I understand, and it, it just covers the entire land. This is the picture of the Babylonians. They just cover the entire land. There is no escape from, from this imminent dust storm. They sweep by like the wind, and they go on. And there's nothing you can do about it. Powerful imagery that tells us one thing about the, about the Babylonians. They are unstoppable. The irony, God calls them guilty men whose own might, their strength, is their God. Do you see that? Who's their God? Their own might, their own strength, is their God. Can I just tell you something? God uses guilty men to accomplish his will to punish his children. That's what happens. Well, God promised he would punish the Israelites over and over again throughout the Old Testament scriptures. Prophet after prophet warned this stiff-necked people to turn back to God and his ways, yet time after time they did their own thing. They whored after other gods. They desired what every other nation had. They emulated the wicked practices of their neighbors. And God was patient with them, long-suffering in fact, but that was coming to an end, and it was going to come to an end in a very dramatic way. And God knew that this would blow Habakkuk's mind. And like I said, next week we're going to deal with that more specifically. But I want you to focus in on this fact, that God uses the ungodly to accomplish his will. Now I want you to think about that. God uses the ungodly to accomplish his will, in part because we are all ungodly. Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 18 says, What then? Are Jews, off, are Jews any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They're, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. How does that passage start off? All. All. That's us, folks. And we all are ungodly except for one, the sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20 says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the body, the church. He's the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that everything, in everything, he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Just, just like God. Just like God used the guilty Babylonians to punish the children of Israel, so he used wicked men to punish Jesus Christ. The difference? God's children deserve punishment. Jesus, the sinless Son of God, did not. I think we can understand this morning why the Israelites were punished. But why was Jesus well, Paul goes on to say in the second part of that chapter in verse 1, and verse 21 rather, of chapter 1, And you, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless, above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed by all creation under heaven, and of which Paul, I, Paul, became a minister. Listen, God used sinful men to punish the sinful one, Jesus, for our own redemption, for your redemption. Isaiah says that he was pleased. 
It pleased the Father to crush the Son because by killing the Son, life became possible for us who are spiritually dead. Sometimes, many times, it's exceedingly difficult to understand what God is up to and what he's doing behind the scenes. Why why does it take so long sometimes for God to answer our prayer? Why does God allow evil to survive and thrive in our world today? Why? Why? Why do these things continue to happen? Well, as we've learned, it's okay to ask why. It's okay to ask why. Job asked why. Habakkuk asked why. We should. We need to be careful to remember the character of the one in whom we question. But it's okay to ask why. Ravi Zacharias has a marvelous story. Uh, He wrote a book called The Grand Weaver talking um, talking about the questions of life and why life is so difficult. And uh, he likened it to, uh, he being Indian, likened it to um, the tapestries that are woven over in India. And if you see a tapestry woven in India, you'll, you'll see gnarled up knots, you'll see various colors, you'll see all kinds of a mess as they're weaving this tapestry together. Now, when you look at the other side of the tapestry, you see a beautiful design and it makes perfect sense of what they've been doing. On the back, makes no sense whatsoever. On the front, a beautiful design. When we're tempted to think God is unjust, simply look to the cross. Listen, the cross is where justice and mercy meet. The cross is the center of God's gorgeous, beautiful tapestry. There are going to be times in our lives where it makes no sense what God is doing. But we can trust Him that He is the grand weaver and He is weaving everything together for His glory. That's His main purpose. But also for your good. That's His heart's desire. And so at the cross, justice and mercy meet in the person of Jesus Christ. I'm not sure what you're facing today. What are you you crying out to God for? But the glorious answer, folks, the glorious answer is resolved in the cross. When, When we lost a little baby, when Angie was pregnant and lost a little baby, we can have hope because of the cross that one day we'll see that child again. You know, when Angie and I are having struggles in our marriage and she's calling me bad names, she doesn't do that. I'm just kidding. But when we're struggling in our marriage, the resolution is in the cross. Because Jesus Christ died for the sin of pride, the sin of arrogance, the sin of selfishness, the sin of wanting to have things my way. Jesus Christ died for those things, and when I'm reminded about the beautiful tapestry with the center of that tapestry is the cross of Jesus Christ, then it helps me to die to myself and start to live for Christ. So when I say that when we're tempted to think God is unjust, that is exactly what Satan wants us to think. He is not unjust. His justice was demonstrated on the cross. And when Jesus rose from the dead, we have the hope of eternal life because of that. Ladies and gentlemen, look to the cross. That's where justice truly is. Father God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for this this very relevant story in the Old Testament. We thank you for Habakkuk. We thank you for his passion, for your glory, for your holiness, for your righteousness. We we thank you that he exuded passion for you. And God, may we exude that same passion. Father, may we be concerned about the holiness of your people today. May we, as a church, individually be concerned about our own holiness. What are we engaged in? Are we engaged in things that are tawdry and cheap and sinful and wicked? 
Or are we pursuing the righteous God of the universe? God, help us to become more and more like Jesus. Help us to care to become more and more like Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's some here today that do not have a relationship with you, I pray that they would turn from their sin, that they would taste and see that you are good, that they would repent and place their faith in the only one that can save them, where justice and mercy meet at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.